Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Max McGillivray. Welcome to our first inaugural Beanstalk.Global introduction <laughs> webinar. Um, just to give you a quick pricey of what Beanstalk is about, because we literally only launched this 48 hours ago. Um, Beanstalk is the social enterprise that supports, educates and promotes the global fresh food industry to help it thrive and grow faster. We were looking at uh, launching this summer, but with everything that's going on, we decided the best thing to do was to accelerate the, the launch of, uh, of, of Beanstalk. Um, in, in what I do in my normal day job, which is uh, running with my great team, a uh, recruitment business, we felt pretty impotent uh, whilst we've entered this, pro uh, this, this situation of a, of a crisis because of this uh, inferal, inferal virus. So what we wanted to do was we, we can't get out into the fields and, and, and pick and, and load lorries uh, because we, we don't have the, those connections or that skill set. But we wanted to use our UK and international net network to the benefit of you all uh, by connecting and communicating correct information and creating, we think, a much needed community. So just so on that side, if you want to push out, push out a message, promote a service that will assist and be involved with our webinars, let's get talking. So we're here in the short term to create that community and spread good news or and news about where the food sector is going. We would not have been able to have got to this point if it wasn't for our amazing sponsors who all very kindly got involved uh, with us at this uh, early stage. So we got a lot of thanks uh, to them. So let's get on to the subject of the, of the day. We've um, decided to set up this web webinar titled up the five things that all fresh businesses need to know to survive the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, we've been blessed to source four key experts from the food sectors who've got an understanding not only the UK, but the international food arena. So in no particular order, we have amazing Barbara uh, Bray, MBE, who's our food safety expert. We've got Sterling Crew, who's the uh, chair of the food um, I got Sterling. I'm not going to be able to say this because my my grammar is so bad. The chair of the Food Authenticity Network Advisory Board. Um, we've got Tim O'Malley, um, who's very well known within the fresh food sectors as Group MD of Nationwide Produce, and we've also got um, Joe Shaw Roberts, Insight Director uh, for Cantar. Um, so what we're going to do, I'm just going to get if it's okay with uh, with Sterling Ster for Sterling to give a bit of um, a state of the union as to where he thinks we are within this current crises and then we're going to then swap over to to joe and tim and barbara just to give their, their view and then we're then going to roll into a q a session we've already got some questions that have already come in thank you very much for for the folk that have done that and we're we'll just to turn it into a debate we'll, we'll talk for about 40 50 minutes see where we get to from there and then we'll do a follow-up to all the kind of people that are very kindly registered in or and who are looking at us on on facebook so if that's okay, Sterling, let's uh, far, far off with, the, with, with yourself. Can we just have a little bit of a, um, a bit, bit more of a professional background than the one I, I gave you so that um, everyone can be aware and, and then gain your understanding as to where we are in this, uh, in this current situation? Thank you. Thank you, Max, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. So my name's Sterling Crew. I've been in the food industry for some years. I've worked in retailing for Marks & Spencer and for Tesco. I've worked for Coke and Disney and been a technical director in two fat manufacturing businesses. Uh, undoubtedly, this is the worst crisis that I've seen in our industry and the worst public ish health issue that I've experienced in my career as well. <coughs> I can take us a step back before we start looking in the future. In January, I was asked to contribute an article on coronavirus as it was then and the gist had been discovered in uh, China. And I wrote that this could have a uh, really disastrous public health impact. And what I was highlighting was the disproportionate effect it would have on our economy and on businesses. And I had a lot of criticism from people saying I was overblowing the risk. And it was nowhere near what we have now. So this has been a real shock for everyone. So at the time I was saying to people, um, develop your crisis management systems. Don't wait until you're in a crisis before you have a management system that can deal with it. But I think the whole industry and most of the country um, wasn't aware of how big this was going to be. So it has been a real disaster for us. Now, so let's pluck some good news out of this, which is very difficult to do. Well, the good news is that it's not a food safety issue, which is important to our industry. And we've seen from the Food and Drink Administration, FDA, WHO, EFSA, everybody is saying that this is a safe issue for food with our current knowledge. And they're doing that by looking at other similar diseases like SARS in the past. So that should give us 
uh, some confidence. The other confidence is that the control measures are actually very simple. Doing them is immensely difficult and challenging. So simply by washing our hands, having social distancing, isolating ourselves if we become infected, um, and just being aware of the controls that we can exhibit from our own personal being without having anybody else doing something will be the thing that controls this uh, virus. But can we do it? Um, hopefully in the food industry, there is a culture of people washing their hands anyway, but in the general public, a recent survey showed that half of people when asked, do you wash your hands after going to the toilet said, no, they didn't. So that's the major issue we have. It's not a habitual thing, the main control measure. Remember, antibiotics don't work. Remember, we're going to have to wait probably a year for a vaccine that helps us out. So what are our big challenges ahead? I think especially for the fresh produce industry is the workforce. It's estimated in September that we're going to start having real problems where we'll have 80,000 people less in our business that we need. And that's largely due to restrictions of movement. So that will have a big effect. Obviously, a lot of people have been made redundant in the food industry. A lot of my friends are redundant now. Um, but it's largely hit the food service sector, yep, yep. Pubs, restaurants, whereas where there's the, maybe an opportunity for us is there's a lot of <laughs> unemployed people. If we could redirect those people back into the produce, fresh foods industry, there might be an opportunity to plug that gap and we don't have uh, vegetables and fruit rotting in the fields. And perhaps the last thing that I might comment on is that um, in every crisis, there's an opportunity. And although... Um, a lot of people who supply to food service and hospitality are seeing their customers disappear. Uh, the great thing is that there are other ways that you can get the food through. Um, uh, if you look at retailing, some retailers are taking uh, fruit and vegetables from sources that they wouldn't have done before. And more importantly, some people are actually seeing a growth in the fresh food industry where they're doing new things like delivering to doorsteps. So um, <coughs> in summation, this is the most challenging Thing I think we'll see in our professional careers. There are some good points to pick out of it. There are some opportunities, but the thing I'd really urge people on is get ready with your exit plan because this will pass. And when it passes, there will be some opportunities then to get back into the marketplace and get business back to normal and start filling that supply pipeline. And I think there'll be some opportunities out of this um, disastrous set of events. Sterling, so do you think there's going to be a fundamental change of the, of the retail food service sector when we do get out the, the other side of this? I think we'll go back to normal. But the thing that will change, I think people become more accustomed to getting things online. We've seen the retailers are really struggling now to get online deliveries out to people. Yeah. And I think a lot of people in our industry in fresh produce are seeing this as a marvellous opportunity of almost cutting out the middleman and going straight to the consumer. Yeah, yeah, and I've yeah. lots of reports where people are doing very well out of this because consumers want something delivered to their door. They're shying away from shops and who knows what retail shops would look like in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, and we've seen some specific examples. There's the likes of Watts Farms, Watts Farms down in Kent. So they, they are half roughly retail and half wholesale food service into the um, London markets. And, and that market disappeared overnight. But within a three, four day period, they managed to set up an online uh, web shop for people within a 50 mile radius of the main site in Kent to have home deliveries of everything from milk through to, to vegetables. Tim, come on, you're our industry expert. You're the man on the ground. What's your view? <coughs> Yeah, it's been a roller coaster ride of a week. I've never known anything like it. So on Monday night, I sat there like most people listening to Boris. And in one sentence, he, uh, he, he, uh, he downed the whole food service industry, the whole hospitality industry. Uh, and we came in on Tuesday morning thinking this was going to be a disaster. I had my usual eight o'clock phone call with my brother. Tim, Tim, Tim sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Can you just give a description as to nationwide? Because we, we would know you, but there'll be a number of people, especially on an international <coughs> basis, listening in that won't, won't know about you and your business. Right, okay. So we've been in business 45 years. We do everything in fresh produce. We grow it, we grade it, we trade it, we import, we export. Uh, probably above all else, though, we're importers. Uh, and uh, we trade produce... Uh, sell it throughout Europe and buy it from all over the world. Uh, 150 million turnover and uh, been in business 45 years, like I said. Um, so that's what we do. Uh, and it's 100% and it's fresh produce. That's what we do. Um, so 
yeah, so came in on Tuesday morning after the announcement by Boris to tell people not to go to pubs or bars or restaurants. And we thought it was going to, you know, having a chat with my brother and think, saying, this isn't good, you know, it isn't looking good. What do we need to do to adapt? How do we get through this? Because food service is a big part of our business. Um, and yeah, that's the other thing I should have said. We, we sort of describe ourselves as non-retail specialists. We don't uh, we don't yeah. do much to the retail sector, not directly, although we do do quite a bit indirectly. Uh, on Tuesday, by the close of play on Tuesday, trading was down a bit on normal. It wasn't as disastrous as we thought it might be. Wednesday, we're finding people starting to adapt. And I have to take my hats off to these nimble businesses in this industry. Who, uh, who are able to adapt so readily. Um, one food service company that we deal with in the West Country had his head in his hands on Monday night, and then um, by, <clears throat> by Wednesday, uh, in many supplies restaurants, by Wednesday he's thinking, hold on a second, I've got a fleet of long wheelbase Mercedes vans, uh, fills them with veg, and just sends his drivers out on every street corner, which in normal times would be illegal, but in these times, absolutely fine. Uh, opens the doors and there's a queue and he's getting not only is he selling veg but he's getting much needed cash coming in um another you mentioned watch farms uh, another food service uh, company that we deal with uh, in east anglia um instantly got on his facebook and said we're going to start doing a veg box delivery sc- uh, scheme and then and then what we're starting to see is huge differences even in in whole, in markets in the same city so Spitalfields has gone through the roof. Um, Spitalfields uh, traditionally uh, is um, ethnic grocery stores yep. are the main things that Spitalfields uh, uh, serves. And therefore, that's gone through the roof. New Covent Garden is on its knees. Uh, New Covent Garden mainly supplies the West End restaurants. Yep. Um, as an example of that, I was speaking to a Lancashire haulier. He says that he tends to do three or four trucks a night to each. Uh, the other night, I think it was Thursday night last week, he did, uh, um, uh, what did he say now? Yeah, he did um, six to eight pallets to Covent Garden and eight truckloads to Spitalfield. Um, wow. And he said, uh, you know, the difference in those two. And I believe that there's, mar- there's markets around the country as well, opening the doors to the public, uh, which, you know, the first time the public are more than happy to buy a 25 kilo bag of spuds or a 10 kilo bag of carrots or whatever, and they're opening the doors. Normally they wouldn't let them in. I think that's... Again, yeah. it's giving them cash, it's giving them sales, and it's giving them cash. Uh, so Wednesday, we actually actually saw a bit of an uplift in trade. And then Thursday, uh, another uplift, because we were straight on it, realising that particularly it, it was in terms of perishability, in terms of what's the most popular. So your root crops, number one, most popular. Your onions, your carrots, your potatoes. Then your brassicas. Uh, on the fruit side, mainly your citrus. Uh, and we just started to see an uplift, so we're, we're straight on it. We're all over it like a cheap suit. So, so, so Tim, Tim, mostly UK produce. The upsurge has been in UK produce. Well, it, well, what what we what we started doing was just started importing from everywhere uh, and okay. getting produce into the UK, getting produce into our warehouses, into our depots in Holland, our depots in Evesham, okay. uh, depots in Kent, filling up the warehouses uh, because we could see actually an upsurge in trade. Yeah. And well done. Fri- okay. by, by Friday, we had our one of our busiest days ever. Well, okay. Because so, one thing that we picked up this morning, there's going to be an issue of lorries coming in from the continent into the UK because normally they'd be, especially lorries from the likes of uh, Morocco or Spain, that there'd be a two-man team. But now yeah. it's been recommended that there's only one driver for o- obvious reasons. So it's, that's now going to extend the... Instead of 24 hours to come into the UK, it's going to take 48 hours. What, what's your views oh, of that? We're, we're seeing that already in Spain. There's some major issues coming out of Spain. We've got we've got quite a large business in Spain, and uh, I mean for some time now we've seen a big increase in the transport rate. Um, so we we would normally pay 175 euros a, approximately a pallet to the UK at this time of year. We're paying about 220 225 now, so that's about a 30 percent uplift. Wow. Uh, you mentioned there's no second drivers allow, are allowed in cabs. So instead of, uh, you know, we, we would often uh, pay a transport company, let's say an extra 500 euros and put an extra driver on, mate, and then you get the, you get the product in earlier. Normally in about three days for two drivers, and it's about four, four and a half days for one driver. So you're already seeing uh, an extension on, on our long takes. And then we're also getting issues with 
uh, driver saying, we're only going to go to one place yeah. and uh, we're not going to go to a multitude of uh, uh, stops. Uh, we're not keen on going to wholesale markets. We want to yeah. go to one place which has got a good yeah. facility for, for dealing with it and just drop the lot. Um, that's fine by us. We can handle that. Um, but it just means instead of sending product direct to market or direct to a group of customers in the Midlands or whatever, we're just having, having to drop it in Eastham, which again, it adds cost, it adds time. Okay. Um, and, and, and Tim, do you think this is a, but a short-term spike because, because of the panic buying that's happening in the UK? And there were reports this morning that we're seeing um, upwards of 30% food wastage now because people have overbought. So do you think this is just a, a false spike? And it, it's got to calm down at some time. And we're already trading today. We, we notice he's down a little right. bit. And okay. uh, we're hearing from some guys that, you know, you go into supermarkets at the moment and things seem to be returning to normal. Uh, uh, shelves are stocked. So okay. I think it'll come down, but uh, not back to normal levels. It'll still be, it'll still yeah. be above. Uh, okay. Um, it's, Tim, I don't know if you picked up that uh, I'm speaking to our landlord of our, of our site here, and he runs a large transport business, and MOTs for lorries have been quashed for the next three months to get through this period. Barbara, do you think there's going to be um, a, a need for technical accreditations and specifications to be, I can't think of another word, dumbed down just to get this product in? What, what, what are your thoughts? It's an interesting way of looking at it. So from what your question is, it's about do we have to change the accreditations or make them easier for people to access? Easy. It looks like the, the supply chain, it tends to be that a, a large scale business will have a set of accreditations to supply a wide range of people. So if they're having to supply more people, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to scale back on what they're doing on the accreditation side because they had it anyway. One thing I have noticed though that's between the retail and the, and the food service sectors, you do get a little bit of a difference where you might have some people who just supply one and just supply the other. But even then, a lot of people still have to have BRC agents and brokers. So at the very least, it's, it's kind of a level playing field. Um, but once you start of going beyond that supply chain and, and looking at people who are just trading with the marketplace, I think that's a whole different ball game. But um, okay. for for things like carrots and potatoes it's not exactly high risk anyway so okay and, and barbara i need to ask you uh, a question that i've been asked a number of times this, this, this morning uh, there's this covid19 if there's a if there's a picker in, in spain or morocco um and they pick a piece of fruit or salad um and it comes through the supply chain can can joe schmo in, in newcastle uh, uh, get get the virus because of that it, it being stuck in that product <laughs> Again, I keep seeing that question, and, and like you say, there's a lot of concern about it, but at the moment we know that there is no evidence that COVID-19 is passed on through food. The highest risk is somebody coughing or sneezing near you, so that's why we've got the biggest focus, as Sterling said, on making sure that people wash their hands, yep. they're not coming to work if they have got a cough or a fever. We're making sure that we've got all those processes in place, and I think the good thing about the food industry, and especially fresh produce supplying into retail, is we already had hygiene policies and procedures in place. I think the issue is making sure that people adhere to that because, you know, people yeah. get a little bit lax the days you called about sticking to it. But if we stick to those procedures and make sure that we're doing the right cleaning practices within the business, then yeah. we're reducing the risk all the time. Yeah, I, I had a conversation with a very large fruit grower this, this morning in the southeast, and uh, they've got enough staff, um, temporary uh, agency staff and uh, their, their own staff to get them through till May. The, their problem has been being able to feed them. So they've actually taken over a, lo a local rugby club and have set up mm -hmm. a soup kitchen there where at the end of the day, they're, they're getting a substantial meal to, to get them through. But their, their concern is what happens when these pickers run out uh, come the end of May. So they actually want to see the, um, the minimum wage uh, put aside for a period of time and going back to peace, peace, peace rates. So to try and attract um, the, the UK population to come in and pick veg or, veg or fruit. So I'd be interested to see if, the, if mm. the government's got any flexibility around that. I think it will be interesting to see, but also we need to look at how that's going to work in practice because there are a lot of 17 and 18 year olds around at the moment who aren't going into college. But a friend of mine who runs a strawberry farm was saying to me that a Romanian fruit picker will pick something like 35 kilos yeah. of strawberries in an hour. What 17 year old, no disrespect, you know, there's one in my household, but what 17 year old is going to do 35 kilos of strawberries an hour? <laughs> and I'm sure you've got a great teenager as well, Max, but I think we've got to be realistic that yeah. swapping the UK talent for the Romanian talent isn't going to be a straight swap. 
Yeah, it might be interesting to see if this is a cure for the, the immigration issues that were created three, four, four weeks ago. Joe, Joe, can you give a little bit of an understanding as to um, our audience as to uh, your, yourself and what Kantar do? And then it'd be, it'd be fantastic to hear about your, your, um, your, the presentation that you've got set up for us. Absolutely, yeah. So Kantar operates a consumer panel across the UK, meaning when you buy groceries, if you're a panelist, you scan them in and then you're one of 30,000 people who does that. We record all of that behaviour and kind of package it up into big data. And what I do is I look after the produce area of Kantar. Um, so we're essentially analysing how people are buying fresh and prepared produce. Um, and, and now is definitely one of the most interesting times I've been working in the business. Um, but probably worth bearing in mind that our data isn't released until the 31st of March. Um, yep, so we're you. going to be waiting about a week until we see, until we can really dig um, under the skin of what's been going on uh, with, with buying behaviour. But we have had a little snippet of what's going on in the past couple of weeks, um, which I'm quite excited to share with you. Thank you. Let me just upload this. Joe, Joe, whilst you're getting that set up, Tim, I just wanted you to know, I've had eight texts wanting to know what that thing is above your left ear. <laughs> In the top, what is that thing? Is it, is it a CCTV camera? Is this, is this, uh, the, is this for your Claire to, to, to watch you? It's, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to disappoint you, it's a speaker. Oh, it's a speaker? Oh, sorry. It's a speaker, yeah. I, uh, it's it's a, sorry, clock, a clock, a clock and a speaker. Right. Okay. I think when, when we roll out these webinars, because we want to set them on on going. I think at the moment Sterling's winning with his background of uh, St Paul's Cathedral. And Sterling, if it's okay, just tell everyone why you got uh, a picture of St Paul's Cathedral there. Um, it's because it's where I got engaged to my wife. I proposed to her there. Oh, fa fantastic! So I think we might have to run a competition as to who's got the best background. So far, Tim, <laughs> you're losing. Yeah, right, okay. I'll have to get my Everton logo. I'll get an Everton logo up. Uh, no, no you're, you're not coming on anymore. Right, come on. <laughs> right, Joe, let's let's uh, look at this. This is going to be brilliant. Thank you. Cheers, everyone. Um, Max, you've just got me a bit concerned about uh, my bland background here. I think I need to do something. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyhow, so we're, we're looking at data to 8th of March here. And really, um, you know, you've still all seen the scenes in the supermarkets and no doubt the media have exaggerated that to some degree. We wanted to take a look at with what data we had available to what extent people were actually stockpiling. Um, and I suppose stockpiling can take on many forms, but the form the um, media probably would have us believe right now is that people are kind of piling um, multiples of single items into their trolleys. They're exiting the supermarket with absolutely tons of new roll and so. Um, now we looked at two factors that define whether our panelists were stockpilers or not at single category levels. The first of which was whether or not they'd had one big week, i.e. bought more in a single week than at any point during the previous 12 months, um, or there was significant growth in purchasing, i.e. buying more in the year um, than last year. And you can, you can see to some extent that this graph is just plotting um, on the y-axis the increase in volume per stockpiler. Um, some quite significant increases there. So for people buying baked beans, tins of tomatoes, that kind of thing, we're doubling, we're often tripling or quadrupling our volume. Um, but interestingly, as the x-axis shows, not very many of us are doing this. So actually stockpilers as a percentage of all buyers um, are, uh, shall we say, the selfish few, um, rather than the many who are going out and, and allegedly doing normal shops. Um, although a note on that because um, because we're not necessarily doing as a, our shopping yeah. as normal. Um, you can get a sense of this when you look at individual categories, volume uplift. So each of these um, seemingly stockpile categories have seen absolutely massive volume increases versus wow. the year. Um, so that points to the fact that we're not necessarily buying it uh, in bulk in one trip um, and exhibiting those kind of classic selfish stockpiling behaviours that might um, get you into a bit of hot water in the supermarket. Actually, what we're doing is we're making those trips, we're just going back and doing the same trip over and over again. Um, so it, when our data is released, you'd probably expect to see that frequency metric that we report um, in pretty strong growth. Whereas about a month ago, I bet we all thought that we'd just be doing big trips and, and sort of a few of them. Um, but it's really the fact that we're coming back and we think that we're behaving as normal. No one's really aware that they're part of the problem. Um, but we're, we're just concentrating on grocery shops into far shorter time periods than we previously were. 
Um, and then, as you've alluded to, Max, this is having a pretty serious impact on, um, on, on the hospitality industries, pubs and bars really falling away um, as a result of the government measures, but your, your kind of healthcare specialists, bargain stores and major multiples um, seeing some pretty, uh, pretty sizable um, uplifts in footfall as a result. And Joe, just on that side, um, the uh, Radio 4 this morning was saying that there's a, a likelihood that uh, there'll be no financial reporting required by the, by the city as of the end of this month. Have you picked that up? That's news to me, actually. Yeah. Um, okay, I, I, try, I try and find you that. I, th I think it, I it was on the Today programme. It, uh, it was on the Today programme, but they sort of voiced it as a bit of a rumour, but it was on the Today programme. Yeah. Sorry, well, carry I mean, on. Sorry. All, the, all, all the, the retail figures coming out earlier in the week and last week are really positive, aren't they? I mean, you see yeah. the extent to which Sainsbury's and the cars are up, um, just as evidence of how much people are grocery shopping. So, yep. it's a strong fund for the sector potentially. But, I, you know, there's, there's so what behind all of this. And again, I'd point out that the, the full set of data will be available on the last day of the month. So, we'll um, happily share some of that with you then. Thank you. I, I suppose we all believe that. <laughs> There are a few stockpilers out there who are ruining it for everyone. Actually, it's everyone. We're, we're all part of the problem. We're coming back and, and shopping out wow. more frequently, and that's creating a real, um, a real stretch on our on our supplies. So, you know, from a retailer perspective, actually, the the limit on the number of single items that shoppers can buy at once uh, isn't likely to have a significant effect because that's not the the behaviour we're exhibiting. We're just coming back and doing those shops of of more broader categories more often um, and, and, and not getting caught out with uh, with 50 rolls of blue roll in our, in our trolleys. So you know, none, none of us are really changing, that's the problem at the moment. We all think we're shopping fairly responsibly but it's, it's the scale at which it's happening which means that it's irresponsible. Um, just, 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 just interrupt. It's fascinating how the likes of Italy and Spain, who are two weeks in front of us with the, the issues of the virus, they're not having this, this, this rush, this panic buying. Does anyone know why not? Why, why are we in the UK so bad in comparison to Spain and Italy? I, I don't know what, um, what measures have been put in place there. It could be that communities are picking for each other, it could be there's a more advanced online system. I actually think China's the really interesting example, um, rather than Spain and Italy, because you've got much greater digital maturity there, and online shopping has been able to, um, to crack on at a much better rate than it has in this country. And if anything, I think someone mentioned earlier, it, it's a real kind of... Um, yeah, I suppose kick up the arse for the, the um, UK online shopping industry because because we're going to have to really up our game. We're going to make sure that people aren't, aren't caught in this again. Um, I think you know, I read earlier, thirty six percent of all Chinese shopping is done online, whereas here it's about about twenty percent. Groceries even lower at about seven and a half percent. So um, we, we've got some serious catching up to do, and I think we've we've been caught short on this one a bit. And Joe, just uh, we've got to remember this is interactive. Carol Ford has just come back to say on my comment about why there hasn't been panic buying in likes of Spain and Italy. It's because people know how to cook in Italy and Spain. <laughs> Perhaps we rely too too much on ready meals in the in the in the UK. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, look at the growth of convenience over the last few years. Um, definitely, I, I suppose in a way, it's caught us a, a decent time while we were cooking more meals in the home. Anyway, we were scratched yeah. because we were kind of worried about. Uh, spending too much money, this kind of recessionary behaviour going on in the home. So, yeah. you, you I, I, sorry, sorry, sorry to jump in. We just had David Potter uh, from G's just uh, jump in to say that uh, Spain and Czechoslovakia did see panic buying, not dissimilar to the UK, but it's now calmed down. So, hopefully, hopefully, we'll see that in the, in the next uh, week, ten days. Thanks, David. Let's hope so. Um, but yeah, for, for now, the picture we're seeing is that uh, we're all doing it far too often. Um, and, and there's no kind of sense of collective responsibility. But I, you know, this data is about a week old now. Um, yeah. Given the severity of the measures that have come in in the last week, that we would see some calm down. Yeah. Okay. Joe, thank thank you. That really informative. Um, I, I, are you done? Just uh, just so I know, because we've got lots of questions coming in for the for the for the team. Far away. Okay. So just I'm just going to fire through these and just see if. Um, 
There's a really interesting one here that I've been thinking of um, um, from Lee in Kenya. What happens to air freight of highly perishable fresh produce, herbs and vegetables that cannot book large volumes on cargo planes, especially if they can't, cannot aggregate large volumes for a regular shipping to market? Does, has anyone got any, any thoughts, any answers on that? Well, for, from our own point of view, um, we're seeing that we, we air freight in from Kenya. Uh, about three or four times a week, mainly fine beans, mulch, two sugar snaps, etc. Uh, and that market has uh, has died a death. We, we, we were saying before that certain products, particularly root crops, has gone through the roof. But anything that's particularly particularly aimed at restaurants and food service, uh, and a lot of that is air freighted in. Um, such, I mean, South African baby veg. Uh, Fine beans, mons, two sugar snaps, uh, uh, baby corn. Um, it, 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 the, the sales for those have, have really suffered. Um, so there's there's less demand. Uh, that's what we're seeing. Personally. And, and, and uh, Tim, just help me because they can't get the product in. Because that those particular products are particularly geared towards the restaurant industry. Okay, mm -hmm. right. And, and guys, we mustn't forget the horticultural sector. They, they've had an absolute unmitigated disaster because of yeah. Mother's Day being, being the, the main day. I'm sure everyone's seen pictures and videos mm -hmm. of the Dutch flower market where there's been amazing product grown in Holland or and flown in from all over the road, all over the world, just being dumped because of the, because of the situation. Um, um, Barbara, a question from, from, for you from uh, a great contact of mine of uh, Morocco, from Elena. Uh, we've been told, she says, we've been told that we cannot book our BRC audit. Will there be an extension on the val val validity of the certificate, do you know? I think BRC started to put some information out there. and You can have a look on the BRC directory because I think this will change, but they decided that for the short term, they're going to be re remote auditing. So this means that you will have to do a BRC self-assessment, send that into your certification okay. body, and then there'll be a remote audit that takes place for the review that self-assessment, and then they'll do a live video link to inspect your premises. But in terms of the, whether that's going to be an ongoing thing longer than the initial time period or how they're going to carry on, so I think they are going to increase the validity in the short term, but if we've got this this particular problem for six months, 12 months, they're going to have to make a decision, I guess, at some point as to whether they draw the line and yes, we're just going to carry on as normal or we're going to have to extend. Um, and Barbara, that, that information, um, is, is that free, freely available or have you just heard that? Yes. No, no. So if you go onto the BRC directory on the website, there's also the consultancy that I work with, Technica, have got a blog on this. So if you Look for the blog Technique. There's a whole piece about the BRC audits and where you can find the information on the self-assessment, how to complete it and, and what you need to do. Excellent. Barbara, if I, if I forget, can you send me that link so we can put it up, put it on the following um, email? Because there's obviously yes. going to be a lot of concerns on that, on that side. Um, Stephanie um, Hilden from Langmead uh, down on the South Coast. Does the team have a view on how long it will take for consumer shopping habits to get back to normal? Weeks, mm. months? Joe, what do you think? I think, again, someone said it earlier, it will, it will get back to normal fairly quickly. It's just that, um, I, I suppose it, the other thing is just how, how often we're eating out. I think that's the, that's the thing to watch out for. I think grocery shopping will be a, a lot less effective than the other areas, and people will be really reticent to start gathering in large groups um, once we're used to the social distancing. Um, but now I imagine it will go back to normal. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating just watching. I'm, I'm trying to um, multitask here. I'm reading two, two um, uh, Q&As coming in. And um, JP Dorgan from, um, um, uh, from over on the, on the East Coast has made a good point. Do we think we're heading for remote assessments on farms? I think that could be, I think that could be the start of something here. There was, I don't know, Sterling, if you were at that talk that Lloyd's Register did last year, where they talked about how they've been doing trial audits with Google Glass. So they've gone over to the Google headquarters. So Lloyd's Register, they do all the shipping yeah. audits internationally. And they've, they started doing trials of remote audits. And I think as far as I'm aware, in the accountancy industry, I think it is, they already do remote audits. So I think it's technology that already exists. It just hasn't been applied to the food sector up till now. So this is probably an opportunity for it to become part and parcel of what we do. Because if you look at what's happening from a kind of environment point of view, people are starting to notice that fewer flights are reducing the air pollution and there's a whole knock-on effect. So it might get harder to justify 
jumping on a plane, going thousands of miles just to look at pineapple plantation or look at a bean crop and, and sign it off from a food and safety point of view. I think we need to start looking at how we can use data and a kind of background type of system where we're constantly able to verify information without having to physically go and do one-off samples and inspections. So I think we need to watch this space. There'll be an opportunity there. Okay. I think you're Thank right, you. Barbara. I think we're starting to see that trend already where people are starting to use augmented intelligence in glasses. So you can actually do your audits almost sitting behind a desk in a different continent if you want. And I think this will accelerate the process. The days of people traveling around the world, um, as you say, with all the environmental impacts have gone. And it's very uneconomic as well. You spend most of your time, you've done it yourself, most of your time is spent yeah. traveling, not actually doing the audit yourself. Yeah. yeah but, and guys, you'll know examples, and I, I won't name them. There's a particular retailer um, who goes out to a, a particular food company um, every other week uh, coming up to Christmas. So they take a, a technical team of five people um, because they, they, that, that's a process. There's a discounter that also uh, buys product from that uh, food supplier who hasn't been on site in two years because they just ride on the, on the, on the shirt tails of that, that bigger, bigger retailer. So there's that, that cost application there. So you, you assume that this situation will, will, will throw that all up throw that, and, and make, that, uh, make that require change. Um, and so, so um, in your intro, you, you, you sort of semi-predicted the future as to what was going to happen with this, this virus. Looking forward, we've had a question from uh, David Collins. What can we learn from countries which are who are further down the COVID-19 pathway? What can we learn from other countries? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think what's really concerning is if you look at the data between Italy and ourselves and people infected and deaths, in fact, if you go back, 14 days, it exactly mirrors what's going on in Italy. So at the moment, we are on the Italian path. Unless we do something really drastic now, I think we'll carry on down that path and we'll be like mm. Italy is today in two weeks' time. So I think things, unfortunately, I think will get a lot worse. Because we're not seeing a change in people's behaviour. Okay. You've seen the parks that have got full of people. I can see it here in our local village, people on the streets talking to each other. We still... We still don't get it as a nation. So do we need a lockdown? I'm not a public health specialist in that sense, but I think we have to learn from perhaps what happened in Singapore and China, where they seem to have managed it better. Uh, yeah. I know they've got a different culture and a different way of controlling people, but um, that might be a drastic step that seems a, an awful, almost unthinkable thing that we might have to start looking at. And I, I anticipate we'll do that in, a, in probably a week. Okay, understood. Um, guys, guys slight, slight bit of humour. Uh, Tim, is your wife online? Is my wife online? <laughs> yeah, watching this, because someone's just posted up, Tim, you're by far the most handsome panellist of all the male members there. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, what, what if I sit like this? I think that's better all right. Uh, hold on. Oh, there's a button here where I can block you. All right. Um, um, uh, Tim, just, Tim, just coming back to, to yourself, question from Morocco. Um, what do you see happening in the, in the past week and next week in the respect of demand for grapes and melons? I'm going to I just have to throw, throw that at you as our fruit, fruit of veg uh, expert. Uh, speaking to our fruit guys, I mean, grapes, uh, uh, grapes and soft fruit demand hasn't been... Uh, hasn't been enough, uh, anything like the less perishable products for obvious reasons. Uh, yeah. I'm not. I'm not so sure about melons. But the, the star performer in Fruitsville is citrus, uh, particularly mm. oranges. Again, it goes back to perishability, doesn't it? Um, yeah. Okay. You can almost list, you, uh, list things in terms of perishability, in terms of how popular they are. And then there's the other side to it. How how much is it geared towards the restaurant sector? Uh, I mean, yeah. you know, my my colleague, we do. We've got two fantastic companies that we buy micro leaf and uh, herbs etc from uh, in the uk okay. and they're just about on shutdown they're they're they're, uh, they're literally turning the lights off and the heating off in uh, in the greenhouses because it's uh, edible flowers things like that is just yeah. totally aimed at, at the uh, at the restaurant sector okay so your, your view is that uh, so the lights of citrus because they can survive longer in the supply chain uh, aren't, aren't as highly perishable there'll be better prospects for them and i'm sort of uh, segueing this into a, into a comment from my great friend clayton from uh the, the temper grape association in south africa in cape town because he's he's asked what are the prospects for highly perishable fresh fruit like table grapes over the next few weeks in europe so, so you you might see tim there's going to be an issue on that in, compar in comparison to citrus 
There could be an issue. Yeah, yeah. We're hearing about issues from South Africa as well, aren't we? I mean, that yeah. looks yeah. like it's about to go on lockdown. Um, yeah. Okay. And, yeah. and guys, just I just I mentioned earlier about this uh, claim that there's uh, been 30% food waste already within within the consumer. We just had a, a note from Peter Worsey from RAP. And he says, Max, RAP have got a list of all national redistribution charities and also an online food surplus network directory. If it would be useful to circulate to your webinar attendees after the call, then I'm happy to forward on. We anticipate many suppliers will end up with surplus stock and waste as demand drops. Thanks, Peter. Peter, brilliant. Send that over and we'll, we'll put that on the link so we can get that, um, that, that conversation going on, that, on, on that side. Max, so, can I get a bit there? I work for Olio the largest online food waste distributor, which yep. uses volunteers to distribute waste. And they're seeing a lot of food waste being created by the unfortunate kind of demise of the food service sector. So mm -hmm. there are a lot of opportunities if you're out there in business, food service, manufacturing, retailing, to rather than just a bin of the food, actually redistribute it to people who are really in need at the moment, especially the LD. And the network is working on a neighborhood basis where neighbors share waste food. Thank you. Um, organized crime. Joe, I'm going to throw this one at, at you. Um, uh, with retailers looking to maximize sales and broaden procurement, do you feel there's a heightened risk from organized crime and unscrupulous people in the supply chains? Um, everyone, everyone else? Yeah, that's, that's, Sorry, that's Joe. Everyone, I, mean, I haven't been scouring eBay recently, but I think I, I heard rumors of. Um, it's, not, it's not what I heard. For about 10, <laughs> about, about 10 times its, uh, it's, its retail sales value. But, um, I haven't seen any evidence today, thankfully, but I, it's yeah. definitely going on, isn't it? But, but, but it's a good point, Tim, you mentioned about the heightened uh, price that we're going, going to see. Presumably, there, there might actually be um, people stealing fresh produce of a high value to sell it, <laughs> sell, sell it illegally out of the back, the back of the uh, back of Lawrence and Street Corners. It can always happen. I've not, I've not heard of any major in, uh, instances of it uh, at the moment. But yeah, the, the biggest issue we've got the biggest issue this industry has got now is labour. Uh, yet again, it's labour. And, and in Spain, speaking to our guys in Spain, we've got a business down there in Spain, and he said the, the greenhouses are just empty. You know, they're, they're, they cannot get the staff. You know, if, if you're on a relatively low wage to pick tomatoes uh, and uh, the government offers you 80%, uh, uh, offers you as in the case of the UK government, something like 80% to sit at home, uh, what are you going to do? And we've got Major labour issues kicking in already in Spain. Uh, we're really, uh, really struggling to get the product that we need, and we're still quite heavily. We're at the end of the Spanish season, but we're still heavily reliant on on Spanish produce for at least another month. It's that, and and it's that desperate. It, uh, growers in the UK are that concerned uh, about what's going to happen. We've got one grower in the West Country that we uh, that we do a lot with that um, has actually chartered a jet from Bulgaria to fly in workers at the cost of fifty thousand quid. Wow. Um, wow. Because, because he, he's, I mean, you know, when we start talking about asparagus picking and so on, it, it's, yeah, it, it's so labor intensive and we're, we're already having labor issues. Um, so th that's, the, that's the big one. That's, that's the big one coming down. Well, I say coming down the line, it's here because it, it's here already in Spain and we're going, we're going to have problems with, uh, with it in the UK. And this is a bit of a controversial statement, but Actually, you know, the 80% the figure that, uh, uh, that Boris came up with, so we give you 80% of your salary up to 30,000 or whatever. You know, there's a fine line there. That actually can be too high in some ways. I've had quite a few growers saying to me, well, that, that just says to a lot of my staff, I can sit, sit at home and get 80%. Rather than, come, that's not about them being lazy necessarily. I'm not being harsh on them. That's about, rather than literally risk myself, uh, uh, risk my, my life, as it were, because I'm going to have to come into work and mingle with other people. I, I can I can stay at home. I can get an eighty percent salary salary. And if you're in a if if you're in one of these backbreaking jobs like we do have in our industry, what's more attractive? Uh, and it's 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 good in it's good in some ways, in many ways, but in other ways, it's already caused uh, um, damage to our industry. We we've got serious issues with labour already, and we're going to be uh, and this is just going to heighten it. I, I've got serious concerns about. You know, when we get into our fruit season, our fruit crops not being picked, yeah. you know, anything that's labour intensive, asparagus, mm. etc. Uh, your, your brassicas, you know, trying to get somebody to bend over double in the field to, uh, to cut well, leaves. Well, you know? Tim, it comes back to what Barbara said earlier. I, I know we've been a bit tongue in cheek about it, but there's that age old problem that the, uh, the, the English worker doesn't want to go out 
into a field in Lincolnshire in the middle of January and, and uh, pick pick brassicas or yeah, fruit. Exactly. In the, Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and then when you add to that, that you've got a government saying you can sit at home and I'll give you 80% of your salary. Yeah. Okay. Do the and just on that side, yeah. Have you seen yeah. Sarah Calcutt's comment? Yes. Yeah. Well, well done. Go on, Barbara, you read it out. You're more, elo <laughs> you're more eloquent than me. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. Labour providers are also working together to charter flights to bring Labour over here. There was an NFU meeting last week between big hawk businesses and providers to address the Labour challenge from every direction. A national recruitment campaign has been launched by BSF, that's British Soft Fruits, with British apples and pears aimed at bringing food service sector workers into tunnels and orchards. But I'd like to add to that because once people are here, we need to look after them. I was talking to a grower last week who said they tried to bus in some of their farm workers to the local supermarket two and a half miles away. And there was just so much backlash from the local community saying, oh, people are coming from out of town to go. These are people who are harvesting our food so that we can eat. But there's still that kind of them and us attitude between the locals and you just think we need to make sure we make it easy for people to get their toilet roll get food you know do we need to look at ways of how we feed people like you were saying having a, a sort of army kitchen system or a, a, yeah. you know, something like that on site because we need to make life easier for people who are doing this back-breaking work so that we can get fed every day yeah well said I think Tim's point is a really important one Max but I think the biggest challenge we have is with the travel restrictions that will be put in by countries, especially the EU, those people won't be allowed to leave or won't be allowed to enter this country. So it's not a tap you can even turn off uh, mm. because I don't think uh, in the next couple of weeks there'll be anybody flying anywhere. No, exactly. Mm. And, and guys, just segueing um, to, to, to one side, the, what we're trying to do with these webinars is build this community and get people talking. We just had a, a great comment in from Celia Holt. And she says, great work, guys. Uh, keep up the excellent webinar. Thanks for all the panelists. As the technical MPD consultant, I'm currently at home, laid off from current project, but keeping busy as an active supporter networker for the parish council, fetching, carrying food, medical supplies from my local villages. Happy to help local food manufacturers in the Barry St. Edmunds um, area. So if we are in a position to be able to network people together, we've got a, a, um, a brilliant uh, web design company that we're going to get in over the next couple of days who may be able to help um, businesses to traditionally serve retailers and now who want to serve um, the, the local consumer. And they, those guys will be able to set up a website for that, uh, that purpose, for, for people to buy direct from them uh, very, very quickly. Um, Stanley, can I just go over to you as, as my uh, preordained thought leader? Uh, no offense no, to, to the rest of the guys. We've got, we've got a really interesting question in from an individual who wants to re remain anonymous. And the question goes, does the panel believe that the COVID-19 originated from the legal, illegal, domestic and wild animal wet market in China? And if so, how do we persuade the Chinese to set stricter rules to prevent yet another global pandemic? Remember SARS, swipe flu, and they all came from the same place. Sterling, views please. That is a very interesting question. So um, most of my family are Chinese, are in China. Oh. And uh, so I have been over oh. quite recently, but not too recently, it was a year ago. <laughs> and what shocks you is as you're going down the street, what you think uh, pet shops are in fact really food outlets. So you have an extraordinary amount of exotic animals there and they do live very closely with their animals. Once you move outside the city, and I think that is what's created the problem is because people are living very closely with animals. They're using mm. a, wild, a wide variety of wild animals. And I've, I've seen the marketplaces and it's no kind of surprise to me that there's been that really? species crossover very closely living with the animals. And some of the hygiene practices you see in some of the food markets, um, you would say not perhaps the same standard you might see in the UK. So, um, I do believe that's where it's sourced from. The problem is, what do you do about it? How do you take, change a culture that's been there for thousands and thousands of years and discourage people <laughs> from doing something that they think is what they should be doing? But, but, but Sterling, surely the, the, the world uh, economy, governments, will, well, they, they can't, but surely if they presented a bill to the Chinese government saying, you're, you're to blame, fix your issues out, would, would the Chinese government actually do something about it? Well, I think the Chinese government are, first of all, protecting their own interests. And coronavirus has been an absolute disaster for them, not just in the loss of life, but on the impact on their uh, economy, and more so their perception in the global view, uh, because they have been painted as the bad boys. And it, it probably could have happened in lots of other places. We've seen similar outbreaks of similar type of diseases in the Middle East. So it's not just a Chinese problem. It is a, a world problem. Um, but I think the Chinese... 
uh, will be taking a lot of stricter steps to control this than perhaps any other government in the country could. They do have the facility to exert control over the population if they need to. So, so Sterling, do you think um, if and when you go back to China in, say, three, four years' time, you'll see a difference on the street? Um, I think so. It changes so quickly anyway. In the last 20 years, it just looks like a completely different country. It's, it moves so quickly. It's far more sophisticated. The economy is more developed. People have a much higher standard of living. And I think that it is moving away from some of those traditional ways of eating food as we speak now. If you go to Shanghai, yeah. okay. you see McDonald's, yeah. you see Kentucky Fried Ticking, you'll see Western food. And, and some of the traditional ways of eating are not frowned upon, but with younger people especially, they seem to be adopting a more a Western type of diet. So I think okay. it will be a thing of the past. And we shouldn't forget that Ebola probably started in the Congo from somebody eating bushmeat. So you can see how these cross-species yeah. diseases um, can be really quite dangerous. Yeah. Guys, we've got about five minutes before I run out of uh, 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 minutes on the meter. Uh, Joe, question for you from a another anonymous source. Um, Joe, what are the key shifts we're seeing in customer food purchasing? As I understand, food to go has collapsed. Don't know whether that's true or not. Uh, whereas online plus frozen grocery in the fresh areas are booming. Views, please. So again, I'm limited by the amount of data we have available. Um, main March data releases is out in the last day of the month. So I'll be able to fully answer that question then. Um, we see some very kind of small evidence of covered stock rising. Um, head of fresh foods, uh, frozen as well, um, and, and then cleaning products, but that's very, very early days from February. Um, I'd, I would kind of want to give a more thorough answer to that question if we do another webinar in a few weeks time. Okay, Joe, thank you. Um, guys, we've got this amazing platform. Before we wrap up, have you individually got anything to say? Well, we've got to remember the, the, the topic here, the five things that all fresh businesses need to know to survive this crisis. Sterling, should we, should we go over to you just to rattle through yours that you very kindly pinged me last night? I, I just to reiterate, there are simple methods of control. We just have to implement them. And that is the really, really difficult thing to do. So just keep remembering that the evidence so far says that it's not transmitted by food, and there's a lot of good science behind that, that things might develop over a period of time. And just remember those simple messages that keep being sent out by the chief scientific officer and the chief medical officer. If we can do that in our own lives and in our own businesses, we'll exert some control over this disease and perhaps slow down the peak that we're starting to see in places like Italy. Excellent. Thank you, Sterling. Joe, thoughts, please? What, 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 would you, what would you advise yeah. all of our listeners, all of our food businesses? I think I'd go back to the deck earlier. I'd say the you know, supermarket policy of limiting the number of same items that shoppers can buy is unlikely to have a, a major effect at the moment because the behaviour we're seeing isn't one of um, panic buying, bulk buying per trip. It's one of um, heading back for more frequent trips more often. So it's can you <coughs> work with retailers to... Um, to get a suitable strategy in place for your category rather than the, the ubiquitous one, which perhaps isn't working at the moment. Okay, Joe, thank you. Tim, you're highly recognised as, as an outspoken spokesman for, for, the, for the fresh food sectors. What, what's your view? What would, what would you advise uh, companies that are very concerned at this point in time? Try and adapt. Uh, what well, we found out this week, I mean, there's been some fantastic, uh, yep. there's been some t fantastic examples of companies ad adapting. Uh, you mentioned one before, I've mentioned a few. Um, got, you've got to be nimble. Um, one thing I'd, look, I'd like to talk about, which I thought I'd never say, uh, Brexit. Um, <laughs> What's I, that? I'll never come up. I, I, just think, I just think for the longer term, we've got <laughs> to extend Brexit. Uh, gov uh, the government can't inflict another shock <laughs> on business when it's undergoing the shock of its life. Uh, if we get through this and then by the end of the year uh, we're talking Brexit and all the problems that that brings with Labour as well, that, that for me would be a nightmare. The other thing I would say to the government is, you know, they're talking about loans, they're talking about uh, th this headline figure of 330 billion, but it was loans. And loans is just kicking the can down, down the road. That's that site deferred, it, it, just deferring it. And a lot of companies out there, they're not suffering liquidity issues, they're suffering solvency issues. And, uh, and, and they're also saying, we'll give you these loans at a very low rate. It's bloody low anyway. You know, it's 0.1% the base rate. I mean, we're, we're paying 1.69 over base. We're paying 1.79% interest. How much lower can you get? Um, I think the government's really 
got to start getting their hand in the pocket and not talk about loans, talking about actually giving businesses money, uh, which I believe Germany and I believe uh, America are talking about doing. Um, but yeah, the, the best message I, I can give is, is try and adapt. Uh, you've got to be nimble. Uh, and it, it's going to be really difficult for particularly the big uh, food service companies out there, but uh, hopefully we'll get through this. Well done. Barbara? I think to follow on the back of what everybody else is saying, it's all about being adaptable and planning. I think for me, it's about contingency planning. So businesses will have an incident response in place, which will have worked very well for previous incidents, but that needs to be reviewed and look at your key workers because not everybody's going to be available at the same point. So it's making sure that you've got cover for the people who might not be around. Everybody knows what they should be doing. You've got good communication in place as well so that people understand what's going to be happening at any one time because we're in a situation now it's a very volatile it's very unpredictable complex ambiguous situation so a decision that has been made on a Friday for example might need to change on a Wednesday so it's not one yeah. size fits all where you can stick with a procedure or a policy and hope for the best it needs to be constantly reviewed I think having those contingency plans in place so you can be adaptable and run with it is really going to be helpful going forward but well done and looking looking further further forward when we do all get through this this crisis together simon latham's made a really good point uh, he says max I've, I've been doing some work for holland and barrett and the biggest skew uplift has been on vitamin c vitamin c <laughs> tablets because of its health benefits how can we leave the lasting message that fresh fruit and veg is inherently healthy and we don't need to rely on vitamins and supplements from holland and barrett putting words into Simon's mouth and, and, and that they should be buying them from the likes of Tim. So th th sure. there will be a positivity from this. As Tim said earlier, and as, uh, as Joe also intimated, that people will want to buy more fre fresh produce. So hopefully we'll see that benefit when we get through the other side. So guys, just to um, wrap up, so I, I think it's been fascinating. It's, it was a bit, bit of a whirlwind for all of us as we got used to this, um, this tech. I've somehow managed to make Sterling the host of, of this, Sterling. So, so, so you're in control. I don't know how we break, break, uh, break that. We've had this uh, interception from Tim being the most attractive man in the, in the room. But we've had another message in from the anonymous source, Tim. Apparently, you've got a list of jobs to do after this. So could you go inside and, uh, and finish, the, finish, finish those off? That's my missus. That is definitely my missus, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so, so what we wanted to create, create for, from, from this was, was a, a community, um, a forum for debate. We've got loads of things now, now coming in that we'll try and collate this end to get conversation and, and, and networking together. What we're really keen to do is try and get this set up on a daily basis that we'll have a serious one like this, but we'll also have like a chatty show one um, every, every day, just so that we can hopefully give some um, news um, and some commentary and some humor as we go through this situation and try and link everyone together. So if we can all help to participate, or if you want to come in as part of this, this, this rabble that we managed to organize today, that would be fantastic. Big hand out to all these individuals, to Sterling, to Barbara, to Tim, to Joe. We couldn't have done this with, without you. Let's see how we all get on. Uh, let's fight the good fight and let's, uh, let, let's get through this all. Everyone, team, thank you very much. Cheers, Max. Cheers, Max. Hey. Sterling, Sterling, you have to switch this off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the telephone. Just I'll pull, do pull the plug. Thanks, guys. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.